So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Will Deal and uh, faculty at Penn State and in the Lifelong Learning Adult Ed program. And uh, this is another one of our never ending uh, uh, session or never ending uh, symposium series uh, through the American Center for the Study of Distance Ed. And uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Michael Barber with to uh, who's with us today. We're really appreciative of his time and expertise. He's been in uh, focusing on uh, largely on K-12 over the last couple of decades. And uh, I know that uh, I, from the looking around at all the names, I know that you are familiar with his work and, and you know him and uh, he's, he's uh, providing a really current topic for us today. So we really appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to you, Michael. And uh, thanks a lot for being here. All right, perfect. Well, I'm going to share my screen for a bit. And then, uh, although I, I, I'll be honest and say I don't have many um, text heavy slides, as I was saying to Will earlier, it's uh, a, a lot of pictures that I, I want to use to talk through some ideas for probably about 30, maybe 40 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a chance to have a bit of a conversation. So let's see. All right. So basically what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, what's happened since March in the K-12 environment. And in particular, the transition that we've had from the emergency remote instruction that happened in the spring to the remote instruction that should be happening right now. And I use the term remote instruction as opposed to online instruction because I do see it as two very different things. But before I get started, uh, the first thing I want to mention is, uh, so I'm from Toro University, California, and Toro University, California actually sits on the um, lands that were part of the unceded or unratified treaties, sorry, of um, 1851 and 1852. Specifically, we are on track uh, 296 is where we sit, which is the uh, traditional land of the Karkin. Uh, people who are part of the uh, Ohlone tribes, although as you can see the uh, area in the bay, um, particularly Solano County, which is in the North Bay area, we're also home to many of the, the Minwok and Patwan tribes. So the first thing I want to ask as we get to this is the question that I ask whenever I talk to folks in this kind of environment uh, right now, because one of the things, regardless if it's K-12 or higher education, um, that it, I think as a group, particularly as a group of individuals who have a background in or interest in um, distance learning, have some expertise in distance learning, um, we often ask this of the folks that we're working with because they're new to this, but we often don't ask this of each other because we assume that, well, we're in this environment, this, we, we've been preparing for this for two decades now. Um, some of us maybe a little bit less, some of us maybe a little bit more, um, but we don't ask each other this question. So I'm gonna pause here for a second, feel free to grab the mic or use the chat, um, but how are things going now? Because we're entering, for me right now, this is day 237 of remote work. So in the, uh, in the light of sacrificing myself as a student, um, I'd actually like to take you guys on a tour right now. And so you guys can see uh, live what it looks like in the households of the remote learning as it's taking place. So my family is totally not expecting me to do this, but I'm taking advantage of the, the situation. So behind me is my daughter. She is at the kitchen table. Directly to the side of her is my, my son who is online sitting with my wife. So therefore I'm in third and fifth grade along with my wife. So that's, that's not it. My wife is also a student at Liberty University online because we're in El Paso, Texas. And here's two more of what is going on in the United States. These are my sons. So um, I, I have a lot of interest in this. And uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's going 
How is it going? I don't know how it's going, but we're making it. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested to hear some, uh, some insights of um, not only as a future educator, but as a, uh, as a parent of uh, techniques that I can apply at the house as well. So thank you for uh, allowing me in on this one. Well, I'm glad you jumped in, David, because that wasn't specifically something I had planned out, but I will definitely work in the parent perspective now because uh, I don't often get parents at these ones. So that's a, a, a wonderful tip to start off the top with. Um, I see a couple of things coming in the chat and feel free to continue to add into the chat there. Um, I mean, for a lot of folks, this is sort of what, you know, how they're feeling. Um, you know, regardless if it's, you know, how their, their school is going or for that matter, just how the year is going. Because if you think about it, I mean, it was only some 70, what was it, 74 days into the year before many states went in to, to, to lockdown. Um, so, you know, it's basically been most of the year that we've been doing this. For me, when I always think about it, um, and here, let me stop sharing and share again, just so I make sure I hit that button. Yeah, see, I forgot to hit that computer sound button. There we go. Um, for me, when I think about this, um, whoops, where did that go? There we go. I'm often reminded of this. CJ. Yeah. Between friends. Yeah. Is the water over your head? No, the water's exactly at my head. And for those of you that are old political West Wing fans, you'll remember sort of the context around that particular clip and seeing as how we just, you know, had a election that we still don't know the results of yet. And a couple of days ago, I thought that was a bit of an appropriate um, way to, to think about it. But that's often what I feel, you know, as someone who's in the field, you know, I'm ready for this. So, you know, I'm not quite drowning yet. But, you know, things are getting to the point where, you know, I it only takes one crisis before you're at that point. And I think that's where a lot of us are, you know, there, it's just that one more thing that, that gets added to our plate that would, you know, upset the whole apple cart, if you will. Um, in fact, this is sort of the, um, you know, the person I stole it from on Twitter said, you know, or actually I think it was Instagram. I stole it from, you know, said my life, the last two weeks, this has been my life, the last, you know, 237 days, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and, and I think this is it for a lot of us. And when you look at the transition that we've seen throughout the school year, I, I think it's important to really look at how things have evolved. So when this first started back in March, um, in many cases, what we saw was something more akin to this sort of hierarchy of needs that you see here. And uh, really what happened in the spring, I think, is very different than what's happening now for good reason. You know, in the spring, this was an immediate thing. Um, and, and it's where a lot of the terms that I use to describe this, I think, uh, come about from, you know, the difference between emergency remote instruction as opposed to remote instruction. Um, the idea of beyond triage as the title of this, because back in the spring, we were really triaging things. You know, and I work at a medical school, so I use that language very specifically, you know, because when you triage a situation, you basically come in and, and the whole point is, what do I need to do to keep the patient alive till I can get them somewhere where we can actually do some real work on them, right? And that's what we were really doing with the school system in the spring. And as you look at it, you'll see that um, in this particular instance, you know, school, the actual act of schooling, you know, the teaching and learning part of it, you know, is is right at the top of the pyramid. I mean, it's not one of the first things you look at. I mean, other than the white thing, which I guess is all the other stuff that you would have to do, um, you know, it, it's one of the, the actual learning part was one of the last things that we got to. And that was perfectly okay when we were just triaging the situation. Uh, the difficulty really comes with how do you think about what happens in the fall? Because while we didn't know a lot of things that were going to happen, you know, this was what the worry was. And this is actually a brilliant piece. Uh, it's actually a student art protest that was done at a board meeting that was held in mid to late October. 
and they had it designed outside of the entrance of the school district uh, building where they had these, uh, basically you'll see the shoes as you go along here. Um, but this was the essential sequence of what happened at this one middle school that a particular middle schooler at the, I mean, this is, you know, a, I guess what's middle school, that would be a 10 year old to a 14 year old actually came up with as her form of protest prior to the school district's meeting, because in this particular district, as I understand it, they weren't actually doing any remote instruction. You had to go back to in-person learning if you wanted to go back to your public school district. And, you know, as you can see here, it, it gets a, a fairly powerful impact as you sort of work your way through. Um, so that's the pile of shoes. This is actually what the thing says, because I know you can't see it from but I want to, you can see the pile of shoes growing as you go along here. And, you know, schooling is actually one of those things where, unfortunately, it's something that we require kids to do. And it has the potential of being one of the, the, the greatest super spreader incidents or super spreader sources, uh, to use the, uh, the, the term that you have. Um, and, you know, this is, it's an important thing because, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not much good to have a educated, literate society if that means pruning one-tenth of that society or 5% of that society or 3% of that society in the process of it. You know, I know education and learning are important. You know, but at, you know, and the line always is, you know, like it's, it's not important enough that you want to lose, you know, one out of every hundred or one out of every or three out of every thousand people, you know, I mean, and the joke is always, well, can I pick which three, um, you know, I mean, but that's still not, you know, acceptable, I think, in a civilized society, you know, and that's not just counting the, the, the actual spread of the virus. You know, one of the things that we've seen as these plans have rolled out is we've lost a lot of expertise within our education system. You know, if you think about the fact that um, there is, you know, great correlation between years of experience in teaching and student performance, and then you think about all of the high risk categories that people would fall into for this virus, you know, we are losing some of our best folks simply because they have a choice between work or health. And even those that do stick around, I mean, one of the things that we're finding is that uh, because of the way in which we've set this system up, that we're even burning out those people that are still involved in the system because of that poor planning. You know, and it's bad enough now that one out of every five educators leave within the first five years of starting um, that practice. And that's a, the North American statistics. So including Canada and the U.S., if you go into certain states, that number in some cases is as high as two out of every three teachers in the first five years will leave, depending upon what state you're talking about. You know, for those that one out of three that decided to stick it out in a state like South Dakota or Oklahoma um, or Texas, where the numbers tend to be much higher than what you have in a um, in, in in terms of the national average, um, uh, many of them now are getting to the point where you know they're February tired, and we're only in the first week of November. So. And I can appreciate that. You know, this is my desk. This is my desk um, just last week, actually. And I don't know if the ironic thing is, is that I had a fourth device in which to take this picture with. But as you can see here, I am in three separate Zoom meetings at the same time, trying to pay attention to all three of them at the same time. Um, you know, that coffee cup there is not big enough to be able to accommodate that on a regular basis. And, you know, this is not an uncommon thing for me. I will say that at least every other day I am in at least two Zoom meetings at the same time at some point in that day. Um, and I imagine that many of us here either make the choice to be in one meeting over the other because we've got multiple ones scheduled at the same time 
or we make the choice to do what I did here. And then depending upon what you hear from one thing, you turn up one and turn down the others as you're going along. So what could have happened in the fall? Um, you know, I've been on record and, and in some cases in very blunt ways, basically saying that, um, you know, we were caught unprepared in the fall, which was completely unacceptable. And if you're looking for the, the real quote that uh, the reporter enjoyed in here, uh, this is essentially it. You know, it was OK for us to get caught with our pants down, essentially, in March. I mean, who expects a global pandemic that's going to shut down schools worldwide and who actually plans for that in their district prepared, you know, emergency preparedness plan. But come the fall, I mean, this happened in mid-March. By the 1st of April, pretty much every system was closed. By mid-May at the latest, every system had something figured out for what they called continuity of learning. You know, so planning for what was going to happen the first week of August through to the day after Labor Day, depending upon when your school system starts up, should have been a no brainer. Um, you know, and it's not like I can say that they should have had a plan that was set that was, you know, 100% foolproof. I mean, I'm, that's not what I'm suggesting. You know, even just yesterday, you can see these uh, two screenshots from different parts of an article that came out in, in, in the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's online uh, or their app just yesterday. Um, actually, yesterday afternoon, to be exact. Um, it was basically published that the, the Public Health uh, Agency of Canada had updated the day before. So on the 3rd of November their guidance to the public about the threat of aerosol spread as opposed to just the water droplet spread that had been there. You know, and while some jurisdictions, including the WHO, have been talking about this for roughly now about 10 to 11 weeks is when this first started to come out. The particular scientists and experts that are, that are employed by uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada didn't feel that the research was strong enough to include this to their guidance until just yesterday. So even though the WHO has started talking about this roughly two and a half to three months ago, it took, you know, the, the, the PHAC, which has been one of the more proactive groups with this, much more so than the CDC in the U.S. have been, it still took them two and a half months to go through and test the science before they made this guidance. So there's still a lot that we're learning about and don't know about the virus. But at the same time, there's still stuff that we could have prepared for this, you know, because the nature of a pandemic is that it comes in cycles. You know, this was an article that was published in, in Nature back in May. Um, and as you can see here, while they don't know exactly what the cycle is going to look like, you know, is it going to be something that comes, um, you know, where you've got something that, you know, waves that are coming roughly every season, because that's essentially that top one there, um, you know, essentially every quarter you've got a wave coming through. Is it going to be something where you've got a big front wave and then, you know, it, it tapers off for a fair amount when essentially this time of year when cold and flu season comes up again, you get another smaller wave. You know, are the subsequent waves going to be closer to the um, current wave? If you remember with the Spanish flu, it was the second wave of the Spanish flu that was much more deadly than the first. You know, so there was a lot of things, while we don't know a lot of what about this virus, there were things that we know. And, and the thing I take away from this is that there was going to be a second wave. You know, it's not like we could plan to come back to campus as normal. At some point, regardless if it was the first day of school, or maybe it was at some point in the fall semester, or maybe it was in the winter when the cold and flu season starts to come again, at some point we were going to have to transition to this. You know, so we needed to start planning for this right away. And the Wall Street Journal back in, in May actually came up with, I thought was an, an interesting thing. Although, again, I think the first forecast is one that if that's what you were planning on, then you were a fool and you're in that category, folks, I think should be fired. Um, 
you know, really it's the, the bottom two that I think superintendents should have been looking at. Now, obviously this is more, um, and if you read the, the actual article that goes with it, it's focused upon higher ed, but that idea that, you know, we needed to continue doing in the fall what we were doing in the spring, or that we needed to plan to go back and forth between in-person and online or some of both throughout the fall semester, depending upon what was happening with the virus. And that actually wouldn't have been a, an unreasonable plan. And one of the things that you need to figure out around that, if there is going to be some aspect of remote learning, how do you actually get that remote learning to people? so that you don't find situations like this where, you know, you've lost essentially one out of every 12 students that were in the system beforehand, which is, you know, 7% is roughly one out of every 12 students uh, that you had the previous year have now all of a sudden gone missing, you know, and, and that's a big deal. Not just because you're, you know, have 7% of the population now that isn't getting an education, but from a superintendent's perspective, that's, you know, translates into X number of dollars, depending upon whatever the FTE is. You know, if the national average is somewhere around 11,000, you know, one out of every 12 students essentially, you know, means that you've lost 7% of your budget. You know, that $1 million that you had for your school to operate now is all of a sudden down to, I'm a social studies teacher, so uh, some math person in the room can tell me what it is in the chat, you know, but you've lost um, that $700,000, I think it is, I guess it would be, um, you know, which is uh, uh, 70,000, 7%, 70,000, um, you know, but that's a significant amount of money to have in there. Um, the other thing you wanted to plan for was, you know, the equity of it. I mean, we've seen continuously how, you know, rural students and low income students have been challenged with, you know, getting access to these devices. And unfortunately, districts, when they think remote learning, automatically think online. And too many of them automatically think synchronous online, you know, Zoom. Um, you know, how do we do things in a way that, is gets kids away from the screen. Um, and there've been some jurisdictions that did wonderful jobs with this, e even in the spring in the emergency situation. You know, you had places like um, Shelby County in, in, in Tennessee, uh, which covers the Memphis area, where they worked with the local television stations where, um, you know, NBC and ABC and those folks gave up on Young and the Restless and Days of Our Lives and all that other daytime programming to provide instruction on the television for those folks that didn't have broadband. Um, many of the... Um, local stations in the LA area did the same thing for LA Unified. You had uh, in Nebraska, the Nebraska Online High School was originally the correspondence unit of the Department of Education for Nebraska. They still sit in the exact same offices that they have since the 1930s. And in those offices are filing cabinet after filing cabinet of material that they've used for their correspondence courses over the years for those rural Nebraskans that didn't have access to the internet, for those low income Nebraskans that didn't have access to the internet. Um, they were able to put together packets that they could either drop off in person or send through the mail for those students. Teachers were able to contact those students using the telephone so that they were able to continue their learning, even though they didn't have a computer and a synchronous system. You know, because we've seen again and again how Wi Fi and access to the tools continues to be a problem. And we don't want to have situations like this. You know, and it's funny if you read the actual story, the kid walks a mile and a half to get to the school just so he can sit outside of the school. And the caretaker who happened to be in the building at the time noticed that he was out there. So gave him a chair, although as you can see, typical of uh, uh, an eight year old not using it. Um, I see David nodding his head <laughs> there, um, you know, and, but at least he was at a school as opposed to, you know, these folks here in, in East Salinas, California, where, you know, they ended up having to go out, sit outside of Taco Bell, you know, on the, the, the steps and, and not just sit outside of Taco Bell, but be dropped off by mom 
outside of a Taco Bell. And as you can see there in the picture, um, you know, the, the employees decided to come out just to check on them and stuff like that. You know, but I mean, these are our two elementary aged children that we're talking about here that, you know, this and we'd like to say that, you know, these are all things that happened back in the spring when we didn't know what we're doing. The problem is that's not the case. You know, one of these two instances was actually only from a month ago, you know, where we still haven't figured this out again, you know, think about it. April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So a month ago would have been seven months into this process. And we still have a kid that has to walk a mile and a half to sit outside the school so we can get reliable internet. I mean, that's just not acceptable. You know, and then we also have the issue, you know, of, of this idea of learning loss that you hear a lot about. Um, now, I'm a little bit less concerned about overall learning loss. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to read Alfie Cohen's um, piece that he put in the Boston Globe back at the beginning of September that looked at this idea of, of learning loss, and particularly he focused it around pandemic learning loss, I strongly encourage that you do that uh, because it's a really good piece that talks about uh, essentially not just how it's good that they have this break and the amount that they learn isn't as bad as what you would think. The type of learning that they lose. Um, when you look at learning loss, one of the things that gets measured most commonly is it's measured based upon a standardized test. So essentially they look at how a student would have done on your multiple choice bubble test at the end of the school year and then how much they learn, you know, how much they've retained of that when they come back in September. And that's how they measure in most cases, summer learning loss. A lot of that I would, thanks Will for throwing that into the, the chat there. We'll just toss the actual um, URL in there. If you think about the type of knowledge that can be tested with a multiple choice bubble test, does it really matter if the kid doesn't remember that something was, you know, something happened on the, the, the 4th of November in, you know, 1774, as opposed to the 10th of November or the 17th of November? You know, today is Guy Fox Day, which, you know, I know because I'm a Newfoundlander. And, you know, I'm, I'm from the east coast of, of Canada. I live in Newfoundland. And Newfoundland is one of the few places outside of the UK that actually celebrates Guy Fox Day. You know, and we could have a little multiple choice test here. Actually, if I thought of it, I would have actually done a quiz so we could find out here now about how many people know who Guy Fox is. You know, I could have had those four things. I can guarantee you were taught it at some point in your, your history classes in high school. Um, but to me, that wouldn't necessarily be the fact that you don't remember who Guy Fox is wouldn't be a learning loss. It would tell you that, well, that was a, something that was a curricular outcome at some point in your K-12 career, that really was a meaningless curricular outcome. You know, all those times the kids ask us, you know, when am I ever going to use this in the real world? That's the type of knowledge that they lose when they have this learning loss that you find. The stuff that they're going to use in the real world, they tend not to lose that because the thing is, that's the type of stuff that they're able to apply in their everyday life. Now, the whole aspect of learning loss that does concern me, though, is what you see here in this chart. And it's sort of an odd chart that they've got, but uh, essentially it's, um, and I'll send out the uh, URL for it um, at the end of the session, but um, what they're measuring here, it's actually a math app that several states use. And you can see the states that have been using it into the level that they use it over on the stage left. Um, with the, the chart there that looks like it's kind of a periodic table to like looking thing. Um, and then on the right, that's the actual graph where you can see student performance based upon income level. And because there was no school during the summer, that's why there's a big gap in the middle of the thing. I wish they just sort of made a little jagged line there and then closed it together to make it look a little bit better. But the thing that concerns me about learning loss isn't necessarily about learning loss itself, because I don't think that it's a valid concept. 
what concerns me is how much different income gaps have or different income groups have in terms of the ability to apply things that they're learning in school. You know, those folks from higher income families tend to apply their classroom knowledge at a much greater rate when they're not in school than those from low income families. So that period of time that we spend outside of school tends to exacerbate the gap. And all you've got to do uh, is really look at that area that you see here sort of in the middle of your screen uh, from the time when the national emergency was declared which is essentially when we started the remote, the emergency remote learning to when we closed the school year, right? So while they were in classes, going to school five days a week, there wasn't that big a gap between what the low income students were doing and what the high income students were doing. The second that you removed school from the equation, the, and they had to do this on their own, and they had to not just learn it on their own, but essentially use it so that they retained it on their own. You can see how big that gap starts to come between high income and low income. Um, and that's the, the part that really concerns me because, you know, the equity issue really does go down to socioeconomic status. And in the U.S., oftentimes, too often, that also translates uh, into uh, ethnicity as well, or race. Um, we've got this issue of social economic learning that, or uh, social emotional learning that we have to, to take care of. Um, and it's something that I have to be honest with you in a remote setting, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, as you can see here, this was uh, a picture, if I remember correctly, she's somewhere in the Southeast. So this would be the third week of school for this uh, young man here. Um, one of my own colleagues who's at uh, the University of New Mexico uh, wrote this on her Facebook page around the same time. This was the second week of school for Albuquerque Public Schools. Um, you know, and that line at the end, I think, is, is, you know, as an educator, that's just the heart wrenching for me. You know, where is my teacher? Why doesn't she care that I can't get in? Um, you know, and, and it's, while kids can be resilient, you know, there are some that, that can't. I don't know if you guys have uh, had a chance to see this, this clip. I'll actually uh, just play it here. Where'd my cursor go? There is no sound for a second, so it's not that your sound is not working. Is it just me or did Miss Westerland leave the call? I think that's true. Miss Westerland actually left the call. What is Miss Westerland I don't see her there. I don't see her. Miss Westerland. Wait. Um. London took Miss Westerland. I don't want to either. Miss I mean, I mean, Miss Washburn, Lee. Yeah, I think it's random. It's random that Westman just left. Not even kidding us. Now, are we about to log off the meeting? What's my name? Uh, no. So, no. we got this connected. She was like half done with the book. I mean, of course we're not done to log off. On my screen, she's back. Oh, there she is. Yeah, mine too. Okay, can you see me? Oh, yeah. Can yeah. you see me? Okay. Yeah. This computer. I play this because, you know, while it's cute and, you know, I don't want to be doom and gloom. Um, so, you know, this does bring a, a bit of levity to it. But it also, I think, illustrates the fact that, you know, kids are much more resilient than we give them credit for. Um, you know, I mean, and, and this in particular, I mean, it's a grade two class, if I remember correctly. So you're you're looking at seven year olds here and, you know, I mean, they spend a full two minutes 
they're wondering, you know, where they're doing and what they should do. And, and it's funny because you see some are getting up and some are just lying back down and, and uh, others, there's one where mom comes in and looks into the screen and stuff like that to find out what's going on and, and those types of things. But, um, you know, if we plan out these things well, you know, kids are much tougher than we give them credit for. In fact, Five years from now, we will find that most of our K-12 students have weathered this much better than what we have. Um, you know, this will just be, you know, one of those things, you know, for um, my generation, it was, you know, where we were when, you know, 9-11 happened or where we were when the, the Berlin Wall fell. Actually, I guess for me, for a high school thing, it was, you know, where the, I was when the Berlin Wall fell. I'm dating myself a little bit here. I mean, you know, others were when Kennedy was shot, depending upon, you know, your age group. Um, you know, for me, certain segment of Canadians when Paul Henderson scored that goal in 72. Um, but, um, you know, for them, five years from now, 10 years from now, this will just be, you know, well, what were you, you know, how old were you when, you know, all these schools closed down? It will just be that one sort of event that sort of, you know, is one of those collective memories that they have. Uh, as they're going through. Whereas for us, I mean, it's, it's really been tough, you know, but the thing is you have to sort of plan out what these things are and what it looks like. Um, and part of that is preparing the teachers, you know, uh, district administration only three weeks ago, you know, said that 20% of educators were ready for this in the fall. And I think, you know, be, that's a self-reported survey because I actually think that that is a optimistic perspective from those teachers as to how ready they were. Because if you look at the OECD, you know, when they actually start looking at how much of this is actually covered in university environments and how many folks have actually had experience with this, the number gets even more bleak. And I find that actually quite interesting because when I look at the research that we have around K-12 online learning, K-12 distance education, the number gets incredibly bleak. You know, when we look at, um, you know, the, the number of, uh, of teacher educators, both in-service and pre-service folks that as a part of their regular university programs have been exposed to some form of online or distance learning. You know, uh, Catherine and, and Leanna, Catherine Kennedy and Leanna Archambeau did a, a study eight years ago that of the, I think it was 400 and some odd institutions that they contacted, just over 1% had any formal training for distance and online learning uh, as a part of their curriculum. They did the same study four years later, and that had grown to just over 4% of the, I think this time it was roughly 800 certain folks that had contacted them. We replicated, uh, Doug Archamba, or Archibald, sorry, who is a, a doc student at the BYU, uh, worked with me to replicate that study in Canada. And we found that only a third of universities provided any training for it. And the vast majority were at the in-service level, not at the pre-service level. In fact, when you look at even the folks that are engaged in online and distance learning, uh, Kiri Rice and Lisa Dolly did this going virtual series where they looked at aspects of professional development and surveyed virtual school teachers, uh, both full time and supplemental, all across the US. And they found that less than 40%, I think it was something like 38 point something percent, had actually received any training about online pedagogy before they started teaching online. So these are online teachers hired by an online school given no training, you know six out of 10 of them given no training as to how to teach online at all before they start teaching the students online. Um, you know, so what do we expect from our face-to-face -face folks? I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be surprising that teachers are unprepared. So what was a realistic model that we could have planned for? Um, this is one that was done by uh, Phil Harris at MindWires. And I think it's actually a great model. Um, because, and uh, while I'll quibble with the dates, he focuses up on higher ed. Um, so I think the dates, I think, were a little bit different, especially when you're looking at the K-12 environment. But what should have been happening is what you see on this. So, you know, during that phase one, when we shifted to that emergency remote learning, you know, let's just figure out whatever we can do. 
And then as we start to get devices into the hands of folks and we start to get, you know, contracts or agreements with the local TV station, when we start to get learning packets brought out to those that don't have the tools or the technology or the Wi-Fi, then how do we start going and adding in some of the pedagogical things that we would normally do in the classroom that essentially make learning meaningful? All of that in most cases should have or did happen in the spring, even in the K-12 environment. What didn't happen is that next step, that phase three. You know, we didn't see superintendents or administrators surveying their teachers in May and June to find out what tools they were using, um, how they went with the students, which ones had lots of, of, of troubleshooting that needed to be done and which ones were seamless deciding up on a set of tools that would be, these are our institutional tools so that you didn't have one teacher using Flipgrid for their video-based discussions, another using VoiceThread, another using the video system that's inherent in the learning management system, someone else using Padlet and so on. You know, this is the tool we're going to use. And then providing professional development, not just on how to use that tool, but how to use that tool to teach. You know, all of that could have happened before we closed, or at least started, before we closed in the spring. All of that could should have happened in a delayed opening situation in the fall, you know, because there was no reason we needed to start on time. But in most districts, it didn't. Um, you know, so in most cases, we're still here in phase two in the K-12 system. Um, you know, we haven't really sat down and had that sort of systematic planning about what this actually looks like. And there are some things that are just not pragmatic. You know, this is a common model for K-12 across the country. You know, now the days might look different, you know, but essentially what are, you've got is you've got two days a week where one group comes to school, two days a week where another group comes to school, and then one day where they're all learning remotely. And it's not pragmatic simply because the way in which this gets implemented for most folks is that on Monday, I have to teach group A. On Tuesday, I have to teach group A. On Thursday, I've got to teach the exact same stuff I taught on Monday to group B. On Friday, I've got to teach the exact same stuff I taught on Tuesday to group B. On Wednesday, I've got to come up with 60% of the other content for the students that are working remotely on those three days that they're working remotely. Now, if you add up the percentages there, that means that I have to come up with 140% of the time that I need for my instruction because of the model that's set here. Um, by the same thing, you see a lot of schools now, and Will and I were talking about this earlier uh, before folks started to come in, where you have some students that are in the classroom, but then you've got students that are at home in Zoom, and you've got a teacher that's trying to teach them both at the same time. This, uh, I saw one reporter that referred to it as simultaneous hybrid instruction, which is as good a, a, a description as anything else. Um, you know, but as you can see from this picture, and this is the model that they have, the teacher just has their laptop, which they, as you can see here, have to use to connect to the whiteboard behind them or the overhead projector that's displaying behind them. But they also have to use for, you know, for Zoom so that they can broadcast to their class, you know, to the students that are at home which means that now this teacher is stuck within the confines of whatever that webcam will pick up. They can't move anywhere in the room because they go off camera for the students that are remotely. Plus they lose the screen because then they can't see what's going on with the students remotely. More importantly, if you look, if they're sharing the screen to the overhead projector, like this guy is, you know, up in the background here, you don't see any zoom faces there. You know, so you lose all of your at-home participants. You know, the schools aren't set up to do this well. You know, and then, I mean, we can't rely upon things like this. This was okay in March and April. You know, this was fine in May and June. We can't run a school system like this. Um, but this is really what we're relying upon. Um, so I know I promised Dave I would get to some concrete things um, about um, – getting to, and I'll, I'll stop sharing here now, and I'll, I'll put my stuff up in a second, um, but I do want to share a resource with you, Dave, because um, there is one, actually, that I put together that I think is going to be uh, quite useful 
uh, to folks in your shoes. It focuses mainly up on the, um, the spring when we were in the emergency area, but I've just posted it into the chat there. Uh, I did a series with a group of colleagues uh, called Five Minutes on Online Learning With, and basically I invited all of um, friends and colleagues that I knew of uh, from a variety of, of backgrounds, uh, did it in through two series. The first series is the one you're going to be interested in, Dave. Um, and basically, I asked them three questions. Tell me a bit about yourself. And then in the first series, it's what advice would you give to teachers? What advice would you give to parents? So there's some 29 episodes there. They're all a little bit longer than five minutes. Um, but they're basically folks that have spent, in some cases, uh, decades in the field like myself that are, you know, providing advice to, to parents. And a lot of it is actually some of the things I saw you having set up there as you're walking through. By the looks of it, everyone has a defined space, um, you know, and it's their space where they go to school. Um, and, you know, it's different than the space in which they go to for other things. You know, I didn't see folks, you know, lying on their beds and stuff like that. So the, it's, there's actually a physical place where they can get up and go to school. Now, I know they don't always stay in that one spot, but, you know, there is that location. Um, trying to timetable out things, because I imagine a lot of your day, while there are certain times when it is synchronous in nature and that you are expected, you know, each kid is expected to be online. There's a lot of stuff that's to their own schedule, you know, that they need to get X and Y done by, you know, this date and that's, or by the end of the day, and they can decide to do it at 10 o'clock in the morning or at 10 o'clock at night. Um, obviously as parents, we'd like them to do it at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, but, you know, trying to timetable out each day, um, and if you think about it, one of the things actually, uh, one of, I think it was Catherine Kennedy mentions in hers, um, you know, in school, we begin every day with a homeroom. And in the remote learning situation, one of the things I advise most parents is begin each day with, you know, your five, 10 minutes of homeroom. Look at, you know, with your child, what they have on the agenda or do it the night before. You know, what types of things do they have scheduled for the next day? What other activities do they have to do? You know, how can you plan it out so that, you know, they actually are in a, a state where they can learn, um, you know, so that they're not sat down in front of a computer for six hours straight. Um, you know, how do you plan out those breaks? You know, we do it in a school like, um, have most as just as I mean a basic example, most of the parents I talk to, you know, don't plan out a recess for lack of a better description in their remote learning day, you know. But this is a, a fundamental part of our K twelve system. You know, we never have the students for more than essentially a three hour block at any given time. Um, you know, there's two classes and then there's a break. You know, then there's, uh, at least if you've got a five hour timetable, there's another class, then there's lunch, and then there's two classes in the afternoon, and that's your five hours of your school day. You know, there's, you you know, these breaks throughout. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, the things that, uh, you know, as parents, if the school isn't willing to do this, we need to do this on our own. We need to schedule this out on our own. And if the way in which your school has put the schedule together, because, you know, I understand that so many of them, and I just saw Dave's comment coming through, you know, the, that they're Zoomed to death, basically. You know, they are sitting in front of a Zoom screen for five hours a day. There's a lot of models out there like that, you know. And as a parent, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I would, you know, reach out to the, the school, the, my child's teacher, my child's school, and say, look, that's just not acceptable. I am not doing it. My child will be 15 minutes late to your third period class every day because of this. And I'm going to encourage every other parent that I know to do the exact same thing because this is just lunacy. Um, and I know I went a little bit long there because I spent uh, a little bit more up front than I was hoping to, but um, I've got you all back on gallery view now and I... Uh, want to open it up for questions and let you know that I know we're coming on the top of the hour, but I can hang out as long as folks want to chat. I've got to run um, in a few minutes, but I'm wondering if you would say just a few, few words about um, 
these terminologies that we use, and you, you briefly addressed it at the beginning. How do you see remote related to distance education and online? So just a few words. And if I leave before you're done, it's only because I have to go somewhere else. Not a problem. Um, the biggest difference really is, is a temporal one for me. Um, remote instruction is something that is temporary in nature. Um, so, and the other thing I think would be the amount of preparation that goes into it. Um, you know, distance learner, online learning, something that's planned. You know, we actually go and develop out a curriculum at least. Um, I mean, we've all taught that online class where we're only a week ahead of the kids in terms of, you know, students. They're not all kids these days. Um, you know, in terms of developing out, you know, the online material, but it's something that we're planning as we're going through. The intention always was to develop at a distance, to deliver at a distance. For me, remote instruction is something that we're just doing because we have to. And once we have the ability to go back to a face-to-face -face environment, we will in that situation. Um, so that's the biggest difference for me. And, and then the other one I'll use is the difference between emergency remote instruction and remote instruction. The emergency stuff was really the spring. And I can classify the entire rest, you know, the entire end of the 2019-2020 school year to me was an emergency situation. Um, the fall should have just been, um, you know, remote instruction because we knew it was coming. Um, yes, Cynthia, the, the, the list of glossary, I think, is um, something that is, is really needed. And we're starting to see this. If you didn't uh, get a chance to look at it, um, Chuck Hodges and a group of colleagues actually wrote an EDUCAUSE review piece that I will try to find quickly um, that looked at the term, both remote instruction, but they were really focusing up on emergency remote instruction. and. Um, that has really become one of the main cited pieces around this issue. And uh, actually, they just won an award at ACT. Um, so there's a uh, link to Chuck's uh, article. And it's designed to be like, it, it's in Educause Review for a reason. Um, it's designed to be read by practitioners in the field, as opposed to, um, um, you know, just us academics or, or doctoral students or graduate students that are in the field. Um, so I think that's a good one as well. I, I see Kay has left us. Any other questions or comments or? I have, I have a question for you. Um, are you, are you seeing much, uh, are you seeing much evidence that, um, superintendents and school districts are taking a look at their their districts and trying to evolve their system so that uh, when they you know on the other side of this or if there isn't really another side of this you know or, or do you see it people looking at long-term changes so that they can make shifts and have kind of a parallel parallel modes of delivery going or not for the most part, no. And I mean, it's not that superintendents and, you know, district officials, school leaders, um, you know, are, are entirely to blame here. I mean, I use the line, you know, that half of all superintendents should be fired. But um, part of that is just, you know, you get the quote for the, the journalist um, and they don't use what comes before or after it. Um, you know, I do take into account the fact that Departments of Education were very late in providing any guidance to districts. Um, but having said that, I don't know why a superintendent would wait, 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 wait. You know, they could have started their planning long before that and then adjusted based upon what the state decided to, to dictate. Um, but no, I mean, what I've seen for the most part, other than folks that were already embedded into the distance online space to begin with, that are now starting to talk about how this is an opportunity to rethink how we do education and to really make the instruction that we provide in the K-12 system uh, more of a blended or hybrid model going forward. 
Um, but the folks that weren't already in that space, say prior to, uh, you know, weren't in that space in February of 2020, they're not talking about that now. They are basically, um, you know, like that earlier picture, essentially, you know, I think one of the first ones I had, you know, they're just trying to, to, to stay afloat in the current context, counting the days on, and it's not going to be days, it's going to be months, potentially years, to be honest with you, until they can get back into their classrooms. Um, now, one of the things that I'm that I'm optimistic about is that typically speaking, we have seen that folks who have taught online or at a distance tend to use many of those tools and many of those pedagogical strategies when they return back into the classroom. Um, so I'm optimistic that while they're not necessarily planning for it right now and not talking about it right now, um, you know, things that are going well for them, things that, that, you know, they enjoy using that the kids seem to be receptive to use this time next year or this time in the spring of 2022, uh, you know, when they're back in their classroom, those things will find their way into that classroom practice at that point for a large majority of the teachers. But they're not talking about it now. They're not planning for it now. Um, it's not a consideration for them right now. Um, right now, what I'm seeing, in all honesty, are the things that should have started happening in May and that should have been completed by Labor Day. All right, thanks. Yes, sir, I was going to ask if, uh, if, if you can make suggestions to the different states' emergency preparedness plans um, in, in an inclusion. I think we get so focused on you know, the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the, and the flooding. Um, I, I think this definitely revealed a, a need for including this in various emergency uh, preparedness. And you mentioned that earlier in, in um, any suggestions for that um, of how, I, I know the onus would essentially be on the districts, but how would that state capture that, that district and say, okay, what is, how are we going to move forward with this? Yeah, it's it's actually a very uh, it's a very good question because there have been some inklings of this prior to now. Um, as an example, like particularly in the Northeast, you see a lot of school districts that have over really for the last five years talked about virtual learning as a way to eliminate snow days. Um, now, I mean, I know those are only one-off occasions and. Um, you know, oftentimes only for a day or two, as opposed to, you know, a year or two, which is what we're looking at now. Um, you know, so there have been conversations around that. Um, there was actually, and I didn't know about it myself, um, Chuck Hodges, who was the one who wrote that Educause article that I mentioned, um, mentioned to me, apparently there's a whole journal that looks at, it's the Journal of Emergency Preparedness or something like that. And when you look through it, there's like, the number of things that are in there around the K-12 system uh, was surprising to me. Uh, there was an article back in, I think it was 2018, that uh, it was the year following when we had, the year following when we had all of those polar vo vortexes that were coming down, um, that were impacting particularly the Northern US, um, you know, Minnesota, Dakotas, New England, that kind of thing, uh, New York. And they had written about the use of virtual learning as a way to, accommodate those days. Um, there were several things that were written out of um, uh, New Zealand that looked at uh, the Christchurch earthquakes and the way in which both for the purposes of continuity of learning as well as what happened after, you know, things started to stabilize and, and how you could look at, you know, changing the system to allow for, uh, you know, so that was, and I might have the journal name off a bit. So um, I will send the actual URL to the journal to Will. So if you reach out to Will um, later today or tomorrow, he'll send you the exact one because I might have the name off of it. But I was amazed at the number of K-12 articles that were in there. But you're right. I mean, you know, we are having, you know, this is the, the, the longest hurricane season that we've ever had. And we now have the most named storms that we've ever had tying a record. So one more and, and you know, this is the worst year. Um, you've got the wildfires that are happening in the western U.S., but then also, you know, the smoke that came right, you know, I mean, 
they were talking about, you know, the smoke that was in New York City from fires in Oregon and California. Um, you know, you, you, you're having, you know, the, the polar vortex of snow days, you know, um, now we've got a pandemic. And, you know, even with the pandemics, I mean, we used to talk about pandemics as being once or twice a century. I mean, there's a reason why we all know of like the Spanish flu of, of you know, 1917 to 1919. Um, you know, if you look at the history of pandemics, there was another one, a small one in the, the 50s, another one in the, the late 40s, um, but not, you know, major worldwide ones. There was one worldwide. One. We are 20 years into this century right now. We've had five, five worldwide pandemics this century. You know, swine flu, bird flu. Um, MERS, Ebola, and no, sorry, MERS, SARS, and you know what we've got now. Um, you know, and, and and we can't necessarily rely upon the fact that we are going to get a vaccine and that's going to be the solution to the problem. You know, HIV has been a known disease for us since you know the late 70s, early 80s. We still don't have a vaccine. It's only been really the last decade that we've made it terminal. Um, you know, we're all banking on the fact that we will have a vaccine for this in the end of this year, early next year, which will take about a year to deploy to the population. So maybe by fall of next year or, you know, after Christmas of next year, we might be able to get back to school. There's no guarantee that's coming. Even if it does come, there's no guarantee it's not going to be a seasonal thing like the flu shot, where you've got to get it every year. You know, and the fact that less than 30% of the population gets the flu shot on an annual basis, you know, whereas you need somewhere around the range of 80 to 85% of the people to get a vaccine in order for it to be effective. What happens if this is something that needs to be administered every six months or every year? You know. If that's the case, then COVID is going, you know, COVID-19 will be with us for our lifetimes. This is just something we're going to have to live with in the same way that, you know, we've lived with other diseases like it, you know, and I, you know, it, so these things have to be thought through. I mean, it's not necessarily that, you know, that's the expectation based upon all of the research that we have and the fact that it is a SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, type virus that it's likely we will have an effective vaccine, but it's not guaranteed. You know, so you have to start thinking about you know what happens if you have that toggle. You know what what uh, the the Wall Street Journal article described that toggle semester where you're going back and forth between you know learning online, learning in the classroom, depending upon what's happening in your local area in terms of um, you know the the disease. And, you know, there are certain parts of the country that, you know, are going to be much better at being vaccinated than others. You know, and these are all things that we need to, to keep in mind and plan for. And any school leader that's not thinking about these things right now, you know, it's a dereliction of duty. I mean, they need to be planning for this because it, it all of these things are possibilities. You know, I mean, yes, they're only what ifs at this point, but, you know, what ifs, you know, the, there's a reason why in, in computer science, we call it an if then statement. You know, if this happens, then what? We need to be starting to think about the then what for all of these what ifs that we're looking at now. Um, I have a question based on your if then statement. So do you think even if the vaccine is there, um, schools will go back to where they were before COVID? Or the um, administrations has, have to, you know, think about combining probably distance learning and the... Uh, traditional learning for like forever? Or what do you think? If the vaccine is effective and if we are able to vaccinate a high enough percentage of the population so that, it, you know, that idea of herd immunity uh, becomes a reality, I think we're going back to the way things were. While I think individual teachers might change their practices a bit so that they incorporate some of the tools and pedagogies that they've been mm -hmm. using now into it, I don't see the system changing that much. Um, and the reason I don't see the system changing that much, at least in the short term, and by short term, I mean the next 
five to eight to 10 years um, is because all of the folks involved in the system, except for the students, they've all been, when they went through the system itself, it was a face-to-face -face system. When they were trained yes. to become mm -hmm. teachers, they were trained to teach in a face-to-face -face mm -hmm. fashion. Their entire teaching careers prior to now, for most of them, have been in a face-to-face -face context. This is all that they know. And until we get a new generation of teachers, school leaders, uh, policymakers, where you know learning at a distance or learning online, learning through technology is something that it's all they've ever known, until you know essentially the the generation that started say in the 2000 range, you know until they start to become the the leaders in the system, we're going to have the current system with just some tinkering to it. Um, you know, maybe 15 years from now, um, we might see significant change, but I don't see it coming prior to, to then. I think kids will still go to buildings between 7.30 and 9 in the morning and still come home between 2.30 and, and 3.30 in the afternoons. And, um, and, and, you know, we'll still schedule days in, in 60 or 45, 60 75 or 90 minute increments, we'll still have discrete subject area. Like, I don't see any of that changing in the, the near future. And, and um, it's a pessimistic way of looking at it because I'd like to say that, you know, that this would be a big uh, impetus for us to change. Um, many of my colleagues think that it will be. Um, I don't have enough faith in the system for that to happen. I agree uh, completely. Thank you. But, uh, but Michael, I mean, don't you think that the new normal would be different for, for K-12 than, than, the, than the higher education? Because what you're talking about, that K-12 might come back ultimately to what it was because, you know, kids are difficult to handle otherwise. But don't you think the higher education will never get back to the original uh, brick and mortar? I do, actually. I, I, I Well, I see them both changing. It's just a matter of when that cycle happens in each. So I see the cycle in higher ed happening much quicker than what it does in K-12 for two reasons. Um, a, because I think that uh, it, higher education isn't a mandatory thing. It's a money-driven thing. Um, you know, as much as an academic, I'd like to say that all of my students come to me for a love of learning and that, you know, I'm, I'm you know, and all of my administrators are making decisions based upon what's best for the learning environment. Uh, any of us here in higher ed, I think we all realize that, you know, the vast majority of the of students we have in front of us are there for a credential one way or the other. Um, and most of the um, folks that are running the institution are, I mean, they're business folks. I mean, not necessarily by background, but I mean, that's their thinking, you know, I mean, they are managing budgets. It's a profit and loss thing. And I think that one of the things that you're seeing now is that the potential for online learning, if it has been planned out and well done as being a, a, a revenue generator. I mean, there's a, there's a reason why, you know, Southern New Hampshire University is doing so well in its finances and its, you know, main growth area is seen as, you know, their online campuses. I've always said that my, my ideal retirement job is, is to be the person on that bus that goes around and delivers the degrees to all of the people that can't actually show up to the convocation because you get to see them at the best part of their educational journey when you know you're handing them that piece of paper. Um, you know, I, I live in wine country now, so it's either that or I'm going to be a greeter at a vineyard, one of the two. Um, that's my retirement gigs. But um, I, I think the economics of it, as well, the folks that are, um, you know, as you know, I mentioned to, to Heba, the situation in K-12 isn't going to change because the folks involved are used to the older system. You know, those folks are our customers in the higher ed environment and, you know, the customer is always right. So they're going to agitate, you know, in addition to it being a good financial decision in many instances, I think our customers are going to agitate for that change to us first. And then as we start to force that change in higher education, and it becomes the norm in higher ed, then as those folks graduate from us and become leaders in the K-12 system, then it's going to filter down to the K-12 system. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't see it necessarily happening 
you know, next year or the year after. But five years from now, post-secondary education will look incredibly different than what it does now for the vast majority of students, whereas it's probably 10 to 12 years before I can say that about the K-12 system, uh, you know, if I were projecting that. So I have, I have one another question for you if you have time. Fire away. Uh, I'm so, good. so if you, so I know you were talking about um, professional or development for uh, College of Ed future teachers and who are students in a college of education at a in higher ed that's definitely one area that could be um, uh, more robust right in the curriculum what other uh, and sorry that growling is my dog back here um, uh, what other uh, things would you recommend to a dean of a college of education uh, to help with the future of our K-12 schools as they're, as they're um, educating the future teachers? Um, well, it's part of that is, is, a, is a difficult question, not because the question is difficult, because I think the context is difficult. You know, if you were to ask most folks involved in teacher education, regardless if it's the dean of the college down to, you know, the, the students that are involved in it, um, the things that we would like to include in our teacher preparation programs and the things that we actually include in our teacher preparation programs are oftentimes very different. Um, you know, states will impose upon us certain requirements that they feel that all teachers should have. And oftentimes, you know, the folks that are making these impositions have no background in education other than the fact that, you know, they, they, their asses were in seats for 13 years as part of their own K-12 career. And that's the, the, the some extent of, you know, what they know about K-12 education. Um, you know, but because of that, and, and, you know, I'm in a college, you know, I have a graduate school of education. That's one of the four programs that I support now. And, and I just help them through their accreditation thing. And I know as, as well as most, I mean, I look at like our special education program that had some 200 odd standards that they had to fit into some 18 or 20 credit hours or something, you know, graduate credit hours. You know, that's a hell of a lot of stuff to, to cram into what's essentially six or seven courses. You know, and, and that's the reality that a lot of us are facing, unfortunately. Um, you know, so the question that you have to ask is, how do you start to bring in some of this stuff into the curriculum while still accommodating all of those state requirements? And while it wasn't necessarily an incredibly effective way of doing it, I think the way in which we did technology integration um, is probably a good starting point. You know, so if you're sort of looking at that low hanging fruit, things that literally we could start next semester. Um, you know, when technology integration first became a thing and states first started requiring colleges of education to include, you know, technology proficiency as part of their teacher preparation, colleges did one of two things. They either created a standalone, you know, teaching with technology course, you know, three credit undergraduate course that all folks had to do, or they decided that they were going to infuse all of their courses with aspects of this. Now, the standalone courses tend to do better than the infusion model because nine times out of 10, most faculty, even though they were supposed to be integrating technology into their teaching and to model it and to include it in as assignments so that students had to actually uh, do it. In most cases they didn't because they didn't know how to do it themselves. Um, so the standalone course tended to be a little bit more effective, but you did have some colleges of education where you know, that, that infusion model actually worked quite well. I think we need to do the same thing with, with this kind of model. Um, you know, one of the things that we're recognizing is more and more of our students are further and further away from campus and are also scheduled out a lot more. You know, if you're in an undergraduate uh, pre-service program as opposed to a graduate level one, you know, many of them are working. Um, you know, 15, 20, 25, some of them even, you know, full-time 40 hours a week while still going to school. You know, as an undergraduate student, we still expect them to be taking, in most cases, 12 or 15 credits a semester. You know, I mean, that's essentially having a 55-hour commitment every single week, and that's just direct time. That doesn't count, you know, homework and readings and assignments and all that other stuff. 
you know, so finding flexible ways to deliver some of that content, um, I think is going to be um, useful, you know, and we've been doing a, an okay, I was going to say reasonable, but maybe the reasonable is too kind, an okay job on some of these fronts. You know, the number of faculty that we have in colleges of education compared to other disciplines that are using the learning management system for students to submit assignments, for us to house our readings, to um, put up our Zoom recordings and to, you know, post our, our PowerPoint slides and stuff like that. Um, so at least they're getting into the tools and gaining some basic familiarity with it. You know, most of us are using discussion forums, not necessarily well, but using them. And the thing is, it doesn't matter if we're using them well, because one of the nice things about education students, unlike other students, is they start thinking about, OK, you know, my instructor does it this way and, and you know, it's an unmitigated disaster. If I were to do this in my own teaching, here's the ways in which I would change it so that I could address some of the things that go wrong when my instructor uses it. You know, that's how education students think. So the fact that we're using it badly actually isn't necessarily as, as much a problem as it would be, say, if we were, you know, in a department of history or, you know, the physics department, um, because our students are actually thinking about it from, you know, a much more critical pedagogical way and because they're, you know, either active or beginning teachers, they're also always thinking, how could I use this in my classroom? You know, how could I use this with my own students or with my future students? Um, you know, so, but, you know, if I was a dean right now, I'd be looking at my curriculum and saying, where can I add in some of these online blended or hybrid things? looking at the schedules and figuring out, you know, does that three credit hour class necessarily have to meet three hours every week? Or are there times where I can go hybrid? You know, I work at a, a Jewish university and, and we take all of the high holy holidays. Um, you know, so depending upon the, the Jewish calendar, the month of September or the month of October is really depending on how you look at it as either a faculty member or student, either a really great month for us because we've got all of these three day weeks or really bad month for us, because if you've got a Monday class, you meet like once in September, you know, once in, uh, in September, and then you don't meet again for another five weeks because, you know, between, um, you know, Yom Kippur and, and um, all of the other um, holidays we've got in there. Um, I'm trying to remember them now, and it's, it's, I've been here five years, so I should remember the names of them, um, but they're not coming to me, unfortunately. I, um, I live with them and I don't remember the names. <laughs> Uh, Sukkot and 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 now well, that Sukkot is in uh, May, now that I'm thinking of it. Um, but anyway, so you know, but as you plan out some of those things, you know, like for us, um, for the longest time, we were looking at, you know, okay, this, you know, during this week and this week, all the Monday classes will meet on Wednesdays, and we won't have Wednesday classes, so that way we can, you know, sort of even it out. But planning those things, you know, as a, a, a in a college of education, looking at it and saying, okay, well, how can we turn our instruction remote that week? So, and, and in an asynchronous fashion that week so that they can still observe the, how the, the holy days, but still actually do instruction throughout the other days of the week uh, for that. And so, and, you know, the Jewish example is sort of an extreme one because of the number of, of holy days we have in, in that period of time. But you know, you've got, you know, your Thanksgiving break in the fall and, you know, Labor Day, if, if you're one of those systems that start in August, you know, when you get into the, the, the winter months, you know, the number of times where you have um, the Mondays that you lose, like we lose a lot of Mondays in the education system. So if you have a class that meets on Monday, you lose a lot of those. Um, actually, Hanukkah is not a high holy holiday, Hiva. Um, so that's one of the few Jewish holidays that I knew before coming to my institution that apparently we don't, uh, that's not considered a high holy day. Um, I keep missing them up. Uh, I know October is, uh, we've been in Seger, they call it Seger, which is a three weeks holiday and it started um, late September and it just ended in October. So yeah, it's uh, have so many. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a, uh, 
Sukkot and Sukkus and Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. Sefut, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember them all now, and I'm placing them out of order. But yeah, so um, but you know, so those are some things I would think about looking at. Well, you know, looking at how you can turn some things where you know you're rejigging the schedule. So three credit hours doesn't necessarily mean three hours in the classroom. And then how can we start to add in some of these things? Is it a standalone course? Is it infusing it into other places? But being very specific about how we do that. Great, thank you. That makes great sense. And I can remember sitting in my, as an elementary ed um, student, future teacher, I can remember sitting in my classes thinking exactly the same way when someone's just standing there lecturing or just reading out of their new, their new book, you know. <laughs> it's a, well, it's a common sentiment. It's, it's, uh, I think every, uh, every particularly pre-service teacher wonders why they're, you know, why, am, why are they making me learn this? I'm never going to use this when I have, you know, my 30 kids in front of me. All right. Anyone else have any any last thoughts or anything? I really appreciate your time, Michael. This was great. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. I'll give you a, everybody a, a couple of seconds here to chime in if you'd like to before we. And actually, I probably should have put this up on the. Uh, where's my on the screen at the before we started losing folks but uh, oops let me go right to the bottom again so that's my contact information so if anything does come to you um and dave in your case because as, as a parent i want you to email me because i do have some very specific things that that i can um, provide that might help as well as things I think that you want to bring to your, your children's teachers um, because you know obviously you need to cooperate with them um, in order to make this effective um, but yeah so email me because uh, we've got a couple of things that I can share with you that I think might make things a little bit uh, less chaotic. <laughs> uh, no ab <clears throat> absolutely sir I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to uh, chime in and and uh, contribute just a little bit of the chaos that happens at the home, but also this is the uh, the entire basis of of my my paper. As I as I started experiencing with my kids, um, listening to exactly what you're saying, um, th there's so much connective tissue that you've provided today. That uh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, getting some insight from you if you don't mind. Not a problem. And yes, Jasmine, I will will be sharing the recording and. Uh, Glad to have another Canuck in the room. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all so very much for being here. And, and uh, Dr. Barber, thank you very much. Really always, always appreciate your time and expertise. This has really been valuable. All right, I'll see everyone later. All right. Bye everyone, have a great day, be well. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. Oh, not a problem. I was happy to do it. All right. I'll